And today is a special holiday here in America, Independence Day. So what do we understand about being independent? I'm sure that what we have until now understood to be independent is not what the Buddha understood to be independent. Actually, Independence Day is a day when we have a total experience of no self. That's Independence Day. (laughs) So what we're trying here is to draw nearer to that, at least with understanding, but certainly also with practice. When we think about the worldly aspect of independence, we, if we actually do think about it, we would probably come up with not being suppressed by a dictator or being able to live where and how we would like, depending upon our material circumstances. It also has come to mean very much that we don't allow a patriarchal society and thereby watch the patriarchal words, all part of being independent. It actually might help a little. I'm not so sure whether it does or not. Not living in circumstances which suppress an individual is very helpful, naturally. And to try and have an understanding of oneself, how one can best actually develop one's own potential is also part of being independent. But most people don't even think of that they're sort of glad to get a holiday, particularly on a Thursday, which then adds the rest of the weekend to it. But here, in these surroundings and at a time of a course, it's quite in line and very important to have a look what we are dependent on and how much that curtails our assumed freedom. We're just assuming freedom. While there are certain aspects of freedom that we have, because our social system to some extent allows that, the actual freedom that we learn on a spiritual path is non-existent. And that's what the Buddha taught. He taught freedom. Nibbana is freedom, liberation. In order to be free, one has to be liberated. Not women's liberation. It's not even have anything to do with that aspect of ourselves men or women. It's not even a topic. It's our inner liberation. It's being totally liberated from all pressures. It sounds good, doesn't it? The only thing to know, that we can know, are the methods leading us there. If we have ever given this any thought, then we have become interested in the pathway. But very often, people who come to meditation and actually continue to meditate don't give any thought at all to liberation, (coughs) to freedom, to Nibbana, whatever you wish to call it, 
to the end of delusion, to the end of all dukkha. It doesn't matter what we call it, it's all one and the same thing. Very fitting for today, isn't it? We do need to have a look what it actually means because the Buddhist teaching has no other purpose. We may have thought it had other purposes or we may not have given it any thought. We may have heard other goals we may have heard no goals, we may have heard or read or imagined that there is something else, but there isn't. There's only one purpose, one only, and that's liberation, independence. Now independence means to be free, and freedom means that there is a feeling of that within. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are in circumstances which are free. An enlightened person can be independent, can be totally free under the worst of circumstances. And there are many stories about that which is a little beyond our capacity at the moment. But I think it is of the utmost importance to know why we are practicing the Buddha's teaching and what the Buddha actually had in mind when he taught. I can't think of anything more important if we actually want to practice. Most people at this point in the course think they do want to actually practice. So it's applicable. What they think next week, that's another matter. But at this point in time, it's applicable. What is freedom? It's not freedom from outer conditions, although they are important too. At one stage, the Buddha was going to give a discourse. And as often, it was going to be done under a tree in the open. And uh, he was told that a certain person who had been very keen to be present hadn't arrived. And with his divine vision or his... Uh, ability to see further than the eye can see, he realized that that person was racing around the meadows trying to catch a cow. This cow would have been an enormous part of that person's wealth, so he had to catch it. So he finally did catch it, and breathlessly he arrived at that place where the discourse was to take place. And the Buddha realized immediately that this man hadn't had anything to eat yet because he'd been racing after this cow for hours. And so he told him he should go and eat and he would wait with the discourse till he came back. He said, you don't listen well on an empty stomach. So outer conditions are important. So there needs to be that. There needs to be freedom from the most dire want. All of us are very fortunate. We don't have that. But you also know that many people do. We also know that many people who have dire want it seems as if they haven't actually caused that themselves, that circumstances have been against them. That's a wrong view. Our circumstances are exactly according to what we have caused. But by no means does that mean that we are exempt from helping people 
who are worse off than we are. On the contrary, we should be grateful for every opportunity that arises to help others. But again, I'd like to point out to you how much cause for gratitude we have that we are free from the physical needs we are able to put our mind on something that goes beyond the physical. And that is a great boon, great fortune, and gratitude is essential because it makes one listen with the heart. It's all right to listen with the mind, obviously, that's got to be there too. If the mind goes out the window, well, not much happens. But the mind alone cannot take in what the Buddha taught. The heart has to also join in and help. And it's only when the heart is engaged that we will eventually be able to feel that, what the Buddha taught. First we have to know it, then we have to feel it. Our lack of freedom, <coughs> even though we seem to have physical freedom in all aspects, our lack of freedom arises because there's pressure, there's stress, there's dissatisfaction, there are wishes and hopes. There are plans. There is the idea of becoming obviously different from what one is. All these ideas put pressure on ourselves and we often think that that pressure comes from outside. It comes from the people we know, it comes from partners, from the boss at work, it comes from circumstances, all sorts of ideas. Nothing could put pressure on us if we didn't allow it. And the most pressure we put on ourselves. Why do we put pressure on ourselves? Mostly because we're dissatisfied with the things they are, particularly ourselves. And we want it differently, better, more, bigger, cleverer, all sorts of ideas. Even concerning our physical circumstances. There's a lovely title of a book which says, exactly the right things and the opposite. It says, small is beautiful, less. We can never come to the end of our desires. Having fulfilled one, there's another one. They keep on arising. If you hadn't noticed it, please do. But we can come to an end of desire by first reducing and then eliminating, renouncing desires. Now often people say, in this world that we live in, that's impossible. Everybody's going to walk all over you. Well, actually they don't, but so what? If that's what they like to do, I'm sure they're going to find it very uncomfortable <laughs> to walk on top of somebody. But if they th really think that's what they want to do and need to do, well, that's their karma. Renouncing desire is the one way of having an entry into seeing where all our attachments are what we constantly search for and want. And the less we want, the less dukkha we have. So 
if you remember, we have three characteristics that we should inquire into. One of them is the impermanence, the other one is Dukkha, and the third one that we'll concern ourselves with now is Anatta. Anatta, often translated as non-self, but actually meaning corelessness. And I've used the simile of an onion. That simile we should use. Try to peel off the identifications. See what you identify with. It's very easy to see. Who I think I am. And let one, two, three, ten, fifteen go. What's left? What you find most likely that's left, which you will question with obviously the wrong question, but that's the usual case. There is somebody that knows that I have let go of 10 or 12 identifications. Then have a look and see who that is. Somebody who knows? Where does this knower disappear to when you fall asleep? Obviously the knower is sleeping, but not sleeping very well, is dreaming. And is dreaming things that you don't even know. So this knower that is usually the last bastion that we hang on to, having agreed to, not actually felt it, but agreed to let go of identifications, is totally unreliable. Sometimes that knower knows something. Sometimes knows nothing. Sometimes knows absolutely the wrong thing and can be convinced that it's wrong. Other times knows the wrong things gets an argument and argue, argues back. Is very unreliable and not only that, what is this Noah or what did this Noah appear to be when we were, for instance, five, ten, fifteen? At that time the Noah knew everything, <laughs> absolutely everything. Eighteen? Yet a little more, 22, giving up a bit of that knowing and even listening. And what does a knower know now compared to all that, what the knower knew before? Where is this knower? Where is this knower sitting and saying all the time, I am? Where is it? Certainly not in the big toe, and yet you do know you have a big toe. So where is the knower? Well, it must be sitting in the mind. But it's really fighting for a place in the mind, because look at all the other things that are going on in the mind. Does that really have a definite seat there? Or is there also confusion, destruction, dislike, rejection, worry and fear, hopes and memories. Is that also there? And then when we look at those, we might say, oh yes, but the Noah knows all that. So is this Noah a solid entity or a mental formation? Now that needs to be inquired into. So we can never actually ask, who knows? We can only say, what knows? And it's very easy to answer. And beware of mental convolutions, which at this point happen easily to those people who love to think. And there are, of course, a lot of those 
in our society particularly. People love to think. It's another escape mechanism, by the way, thinking from dukkha. We don't have to think about our dukkha. We can think about the fact that if the knower knows, there must be somebody that's knowing. Or, if there's a knower, then who knows the knower? So what you're doing, you're finding yourself in a mirror room. Have you ever been in a mirror room? They have them in German castles and French castles too. Quite appealing actually. You stand in front of the mirror and there's mirror after mirror because they're all on the opposite side of you. And you see yourself maybe 500, 600 times. Or you can see the furnishings of the room five, six, seven hundred times. It's mirror after mirror after mirror. And what do you gain out of that? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> you just know that Louis XIV spent a lot of money for things like that. <laughs> and that our famous Ludwig von Bavaria tried to emulate him, but didn't quite make it. So, mirror after mirror after mirror. And actually, what do you see there? You don't see the real thing. All you see is a mirror image. So there's a mirror image. And if you inquire in that manner, you never come to an end because you can put up more mirrors. No end to them. There's no answer, nothing at all. So the first thing to look at in this case would be, where is it real? And of course, in the mirror you find, don't find it, you just see an image. And that's what we do. We make up an image, an image which we call me. And since everybody else is doing it, we believe it. And believing it, we act upon it. And we haven't only done it in this lifetime, we've done it all the lifetimes that have ever been granted to us. And everybody else around us has also done it. And probably we never even met anybody who didn't do it. So it's a totally new concept. And a concept which lends itself to argumentation. But I dare say you know that argumentation has never proven a thing. All it does proves that I don't agree with you. That's all. It doesn't prove any truth. When I went to school, we were taught to debate not a monopoly of the Tibetans to debate. We learned that in school. And we were given a topic and two kids were to discuss and debate that topic. One was supposed to be in favor of it and the other one was supposed to be against it. And they should talk about that and then there would be a judgment who did a better job. The other kids were supposed to judge that. And then the same two kids were to change sides and they were to debate the one what used to be positive is now going to be negative and the negative one was now supposed to be positive and the kids could do it extremely well so that's argumentation you could change sides immediately if you wish mental formations that's all it is all your distractions are mental formations. All the love and the compassion are mental formations. All the um, understanding that you have, mental formations. And yet we believe that these things belong to me. That they are my own and that they are an expression and a manifestation of who I am. And yet, I can turn around 
and see exactly the opposite or think exactly the opposite substituting with the opposite anybody can do it all we have to do is practice a little so what was with the first thought the first thought which was unwholesome was mine huh? now I've learned to substitute and I realize an unwholesome thought makes bad karma so I'm not going to keep it so I'm substituting with a wholesome thought so then was the unwholesome one not mine anymore or do I have a different mine now because now it's wholesome what happened where's mine can you have an inkling that thinking is just thinking and that there's nobody involved except the ability to think the same goes for the body or the breath for instance obviously we think it's my breath and I better keep it because it keeps me alive yes quite so but why do I think it's my breath has a breath ever said that has a breath ever made any claim to belong in fact has this body ever made any claim has the liver and the gallbladder and the uh, intestines and the heart and the colon and the uh, lungs and the ribs have they ever said anything have they ever said I'm called me or I'm called yours or I belong they haven't said a thing they are a physical phenomena look inside of your body for a second and look all the stuff that's in there we'll do a contemplation on that maybe today or tomorrow and have a look is there anything in there that says I am called me it's impossible they can't talk and the liver and the gallbladder and the uh, intestines and the colon they can't think they are functional and they are most of them autonomous some of them of course are also voluntary we can for instance hold the breath for a moment but mostly it's also autonomous so how did we get the idea that this thing phenomena that sitting on the pillow particularly the body is called me where does this idea come from? it's a mental formation that's all and since we can change our mental formations we can change that too now why should we want to change that mental formation? We can only want to change it if we have ever noticed that all the problems that arise arise because of me. If there wasn't any me, who could possibly have a problem? There is nothing and nobody that could have a problem. Let's say I have a problem with a certain person. I have that problem. Now let's take the I away and say who who has a problem there's no I there nobody has a problem but how do you do that the first thing in the morning when we wake up we know that we wake up I am waking up and the mind says oh it can't be that time again or it's much too dark or really cold in the morning don't want to get up and the whole thing revolves around my own likes and dislikes never ever comes the thought waking up it's all a thought process revolving around me and it's not something that we have to reinforce it's automatic we feel it obviously I am getting out of bed I can feel it these are my feet on the floor 
And when told they just feed, then the usual answer is, what do you mean they just feed? I can see they're my feet. I'm not blind, they belong to me. They're not yours, yours are over there. <laughs> A difficult proposition, isn't it? But when the Buddha saw old age, sickness and death, he realized that all of humanity has that particular suffering. And he was bent on, he wasn't the Buddha then, he was the Bodhisattva, he was bent on finding the way out of that suffering. Now obviously we've got hundreds and thousands of people bent on finding a way out of suffering. There are even, nowadays, I've seen that somewhere, on a, must have been a picture somewhere, that they are freezing dead bodies so that they can come alive again. They, uh, it, it doesn't pay to even discuss. <laughs> um, so they want to get out of death, okay. They certainly want to get out of sickness, haven't managed that either. Some sicknesses, yes, but what happened? We got new ones. So we are right back where we started from. The name of the sickness has changed, that's all. And old age, yes, well, we first we have all those um, little remedies that make old age disappear optically. And our um, drugstores are full of them, uh, to the ceiling full with them. And then when the optical thing no longer works, then there are all sorts of uh, medications that are supposed to retard old age. Well, that hasn't worked either. Old age comes and sickness comes and death appears. So these outer remedies, everybody trying to find something and sometimes getting quite famous because they have found a certain remedy for a certain sickness and that is a great achievement, like the polio vaccine for instance and Pasteur's um, knowledge about hygiene. It's all great achievements, but we're still getting sick and dying. So the Buddha knew that. He wasn't going to try and find a vaccine. He wasn't going to try and find a remedy where you could freeze bodies and then they can come to life again. He was trying to find a much deeper cause for this dukkha which besets mankind. And this is something I would like you to remember. At the Buddhist teaching, is not concerned with superficialities. No matter how, how nice the oranges taste in California and that the rain is actually liquid sunshine, it's got nothing to do with it. If you're interested in the Buddha's teaching, you have to go beyond the, below the surface. I'm saying that quite um, deliberately because it has come to my attention, even in the short time that I'm here, that much of it that is um, supposed to be the Buddha's teaching stays on the surface. The Buddha was not interested in that at all. What he was interested in was to find an absolute solution. An absolute solution to all problems which beset mankind. Whether that's irritation and anger, or sickness and death, whether it is worry and fear, anything like that, whatever it may be, an absolute solution which can only be found when we know absolute truth and not relative truth. All the things that we deal with in our everyday life are true from a relative standpoint. 
obviously we have to eat and drink and go to bed and go to the toilet and tell people what we think and um, deal with our uh, livelihood, sit on a little pillow, try to meditate, it's all there. It's all relatively true. But the Buddha's teaching goes far beyond that. It transcends that relativity and comes to an absolute and final experience and an absolute and final realization. All the steps on the way to gain a little insight can be very helpful. And to gain a little insight and to gain a little more calm and to gain a little more lovingness, all very helpful. But the real teaching, that what is embedded in everything he said, and everything that has been transmitted to us is the final absolute solution to the problems that beset mankind. So when he was in the forest, left the palace, was still the Bodhisattva, went to the forest and practiced meditation. And his first teacher taught him the first seven jhanas. And then said to him, that's all there is, you can now be teacher here. And the Bodhisattva said, uh-uh. When I come out of the jhanas, I'm still having dukkha. There must be more. So he went to another teacher, second one. And that another teacher taught him the eighth jhana. And when he was able to do that, and he was able to do it very quickly, of course, the same thing happened. Teacher said, you can now do everything that's possible. You can be teacher here. And Buddha said, no. Bodhisattva said, no. I'm still having dukkha. What is that dukkha that he was having? He had enough to eat. He was an excellent meditator. He didn't have any worries. His family was well taken care of. What was that dukkha that he felt? The dukkha that he felt was the threat of old age, <clears throat> sickness and death. He knew very well that they were going to come, that there was no way out. And what other dukkha did he have? He had the dukkha of the pressure to find the end of dukkha. He didn't want to live with that threat hanging over his head. But mainly, he wanted also to find the answer so that he could pass it on to as many people as would listen to him. So there was this searching and the pressure of the search and the desire for absoluteness, totality, complete peacefulness, no threat. So he went out on his own because a Buddha finds the answer by himself. Doesn't get a teacher. Can have a teacher for meditation but not a teacher for the absolute truth. Because a Buddha, so the scriptures say, can only arise when the teaching has already died. And so it is said that after the enlightenment of this Buddha, 5,000 years will pass where the teaching is available to us. And then the words, <clears throat> Anicca Dukkha Anatta, will not be heard until the next Buddha arises. And that can be eons away. Also, in one of the commentaries, we find a prophecy. And this prophecy says that right in the middle of these 5,000 years, after 2,500 years, there will be 100 years when there's a great upsurge in the Dhamma. 
more people will not only be interested but also gain absolute insight. We are at this moment in the 40th year of those 100 years. And in Germany, we talk about a Buddha boom. It's actually printed in the newspapers, the word Buddha boom. So, um, and it may last, who knows, another 60 years. And then it all subsides again and goes downhill. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is practice now. Don't wait eons till the next Buddha arises. We've got it on hand. We have the teaching. It's all there. All you have to do is read it and practice it and hear it. And then we actually have that wonderful chance of total freedom. So the Buddha knew that wasn't, uh, when he was still Bodhisattva, he knew that wasn't the end of it. So he went to the now very famous Bodhi tree, what is now Bodh Gaya. And the Bodhi tree in Latin is a ficus religiosus, a ficus is a fig tree. It's um, one kind of a fig tree with very interesting leaves on it. And he sat down under that tree and he made a resolution. He said, I'm going to sit here till I find the answer to mankind's dukkha, even if the flesh should rot from the bones. A little longer than 45 or 60 minutes. And he said, <laughs> he sat for a week. And during that week, he obviously did the jhanas. He uh, did all of them. And the story in the scripture say, that on the night of his enlightenment he went to the eighth jhana back down to the first and several times and as he came out he formulated the four noble truths and he realized that the only way that one can escape from the first one dukkha is when there is no craving and the only way we can escape from craving, which is the second noble truth, is when we no longer have that desire. This really, it's more than a desire, this enormous craving to be here, to be somebody, to be me. The only way we can get rid of this desire is if we see the fallacy of this thought formation. So then, with that formulation of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, he gave the very first discourse, the Dhamma Chakra Pavadana Sutta, Sutta Discourse, Dhamma Chakra, the Wheel of the Dhamma, Pavadana, the Turning, Turning of the Wheel of the Dhamma, explaining the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, the practice, uh, the third Noble Truth, Nibbana, and the first two, what we experience all the time. We want to be because we think we are. And this is the fallacy. And so from then on, he went on foot everywhere where he was either invited or where his divine vision was able to see that people were ready for this very different teaching that he was giving. It is extraordinary and unique. Now, the understanding that me has got to go is not unique. It can be found in all great religions and particularly with the mystics of all great religions. But the pathway, how to go about it, that's unique. First, he didn't want to teach because he, th he thought 
that people wouldn't understand anyway. They'd ask all sorts of questions which had no bearing on it. Right, isn't it? And uh, so, and that would be a vexation for him. But then the scriptures say that the highest Brahma, the highest of the gods, came to see him, probably not physically, um, within himself, and begged him to teach for the benefit of gods and men. And that's when he said there are people with little dust in their eyes. We are very fortunate that we have come this long way from two and a half thousand years, 2,540 years. And this wheel of the Dhamma is still turning for us. We should, under no circumstances, take that lightly. We should realize this enormous opportunity which is being offered to us. I always knew it. Body is just something that we need. Um, I know I'm more than the body. Everybody knows I'm more than the body. And yet, they're so concerned with it. Is it comfortable? Is it thin enough? not too fat, tall enough, not too short, does it look young enough, the hair look all right, the clothing okay, are we having a proper bed, are we having all the things that we need for the body, look at your house, put your mind for a moment into the house, the home, the apartment that you live in, or the room. What's in that house? Everything for the body. Beds, a bed to sleep in, bathroom to wash in, kitchen to cook in, dining room to eat in, easy chair to lounge in, a roof not to get wet, Windows to look out, get fresh air. Everything is there. What do you got there for the mind? Books, that's information. What else? This zendo here, in small, of course, in a house, that's for the mind. So first, there's everything there for the body. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't look after the body. We have to. We're so um, connected to it. We have to look after it. But we've got to get beyond this identification and also beyond the idea that if the body is all right, we are all right. We don't react to unpleasantness in the body then. But... We're not all right, just because the body is all right. This body is going to disappear totally from the face of the earth in no time at all and never reappear. It's one time only. And that's me. Nobody likes to be like that. That's why we don't like death. That body will not come back. It goes to dust. We all know that. Mostly we don't want to know about it, but we do know it. So while we have a house full of support systems for our body, we also identify with it completely and are only happy when the body is not acting up. If it does have anything that isn't right, and bodies always have something that isn't quite right, it's their nature. Just like houses have to be repaired, so bodies have to be repaired at times. And then there are some things which we can't repair, we don't know how. We still think looking in the mirror, that's me. And there's no real 
support system for that thought. It's just a thought. That's all. So that's our first and foremost identification. So letting go of this body identification, we then, of course, having done with it, or partially done, or intellectually done with it, which is also helpful, we then come to the identification system of the mind. We think that every sense contact is strictly mine. We think that every reaction is strictly mine. And there it is very helpful to have a look at the changeability of our reactions and our sense contacts. Just think for a moment over, yeah, think back 20 years. How many sense contacts might you have had? Well, just think back 20 minutes. How many sense contacts would you have had? Touch, hearing, seeing, thinking, all in the last 20 minutes. And how often have they changed? They've got to change. You can't be hearing the same thing and go, would go berserk. You can't, both, can't think the same thing. It's impossible. So now 20 years, multiply it by 10 million or something. So which of those sense contacts and reactions actually said that's me? None of them. Nothing said that's me. There is no way it could say it's me. A sense contacts can't say anything. They just are. And the reactions can't say anything except react. And when we do that, all we're doing is believing something that is to support our solidity, to keep us away from the knowing that we are very mortal and that death is waiting for us. As we actually underline the identification process of all those things which happen in us, we are trying to get away from the threat that we are no more. Can you understand or can you um, feel that if we aren't even now, there's no threat? None whatsoever. Nothing threatens us because we aren't even now. Now that doesn't mean that we're not sitting here. But what it means is that we neither have an ownership of the body nor an owner of the mind, but there is just mind and body sitting here. And they have arisen at birth because of our idea which we didn't relinquish at death, that I am somebody and want to be here. That craving to be has brought us back. If there isn't any craving to be, we cannot come back. Because if there's no feeling of me, who's going to come back? It's impossible. There has to be that feeling of me which then brings about the craving for rebirth, brings about the rebirth, brings about the connection of the consciousness at conception. So, if you have any particular problem at this particular moment, anything, anything whatsoever, whether it's a knee pain or whether it's an emotional pain, whether it's a dislike, or whether it's a desire. Just for one single moment, imagine that you're not the person that you think you are, but that in reality, there's only the phenomena of mind and body, the phenomena of mind and body, which, if that understanding is kept, has total purity of thought and emotion. 
And with that total purity, the wish for something other cannot possibly arise. The total purity is already enough. That's it. It's clarity. It's the seed of enlightenment having developed and having more (coughs) of that magnificent splendor that we all carry within. As long as we think it's mine, we're hanging on to it. And when you hang on to something, you cover its splendor through the hanging on. There's no splendor in it. But if it isn't mine, if there's nobody there, then it can really show its beauty. You can visualize or imagine or think in that way for a moment. What actually happens at this point in the inside path, on the inside path, is that we have seen that mind and body are two, They are interconnected, but they're not the same thing. We have seen that everything that arises has to cease, or at least we have talked about it. We also have talked about that all causes have effects, which is the third step of insight. Whatever effects we have are the causes we have put into motion. Small things, big things. We sit down and concentrate as a cause and the effect is delightful feeling and joy. Delightful feeling is the cause for joy. All that happens anywhere and particularly of course within us which is the most important first thing to learn about are causes and effects. And then after we've seen that we can also see and inquire into these five aspects of ourselves. The first one, the body. That's a very important aspect. I've already explained that. And then the other four, which are our mental aspects, which I've just mentioned. And these are the steps to take according to the Buddha's instructions in order to come nearer to that understanding and then to the feeling that all these things are taking place without an owner. How did we ever get to think there was an owner? If there was an owner, why isn't this owner totally in charge of everything he or she owns. If we were totally in charge of everything we own, like we ought to be with our possessions, how come the body gets sick? Or gets a knee pain? Or dies on us at the wrong moment? If we really own this thing, why don't we take steps to make it do what our mind actually wants it to do. Obviously it has some sort of life of its own. We can help it along, sure. We can support it. We can give it things that may um, alleviate some pains. But we can't totally change it. It's there. And it has all these aspects which it lives by. Now that's the body, that's the first of the khandhas or aggregates. And then we've got the four parts of the mind. And if we owned them and were really in charge of them, why do we make ourselves unhappy? Why do we think thoughts which are obviously of no use to anybody, neither to us nor to somebody else. And why are we sometimes so dense and don't know what's going on 
and have to ask again. What was that again? And why do we sometimes dislike what other people like and vice versa? Why aren't we constantly on an even keel, always at ease, never any pressure, always full of joy? Why aren't we? If we owned all this conglomeration of stuff within, why don't we look after it properly? Who is there to look after it? The one who's supposed to look after it, called me, apparently is falling down on the job. <laughs> Isn't doing anything properly. Making a very bad mess of things, usually. So, with that, we can inquire. And this is the inquiry which takes place at this time. At this time in the development of their spiritual uh, faculties. This is the inquiry that we do. The inquiry into the ownership of the five khandhas, the five aggregates, the five bits and pieces we consist of. And also the inquiry into one of the three characteristics, either impermanence, dukkha, or qualessness, or all three. Now, the absolute goal and purpose of the teaching is to find out that there is no separation, no special person, no me, no you, but also only the whole of creation. Not creator, but creation. I'm just preempting a question. (laughs) There is creation. It's all around us. And we ourselves are creating. When you go into a garden, that garden has been created by the work of people. When you come into a meditation hall, the atmosphere has been created by meditators. But it doesn't belong to anybody, does it? Does the atmosphere, is it owned? Nobody can own it. It just is. And if we think we own the garden, we probably don't want anybody to have any part of it. We don't own it. We created it. We create within ourselves that which is wholesome and helpful. But that's creation. That's not mine. As soon as we think it's mine, and most people do, it's no longer part of the whole of creation. It has been separated, put aside, in a little compartment, which is called all that is mine. We all know people who do this. In fact, we all are people who do this. But we also know people who do that to such an extent that being together with them is difficult. They can't see that it all belongs together. We can. The um, contemplation on the elements is supposed to help. The meditative path, when we get to the formless absorptions, makes it quite clear. There can be no doubt. And when there's no doubt, It's a pathway to letting go of this idea, this person idea. And when we let go of the person idea and let go first only a little, the letting go isn't usually done all in one um, fell swoop. It doesn't work that way. 
it usually is done little by little. Then joy with others is natural. Generosity doesn't isn't even called generosity anymore. It's just being part of everything. And the more we become part of everything, the more everything supports us. But not as a personal identity, but as part of the whole. The whole exists in a very solid way only when all parts of it can be supported. But it can, they can only be supported if we lose our boundaries. Now what I'm saying is not enlightenment. Please don't misunderstand. It's easy to misunderstand, isn't it? But it's certainly a step on the way. A very important step on the way. The more we put ourselves into our own shell, the less part we have in the whole of creation. And that shell is like a little prison. But these are feelings. But they do come from understanding. From understanding, investigation, interrogation, contemplation. That kind of um, work that we can do, investigation, interrogation, makes it easier to understand. And then, when we have understood, then we have to try and actually let go of our former ideas. Now that is feeling. To let go of our former ideas, they are so embedded that they have created an absolute feeling that this is me sitting here. And the only way that can ever stop and be changed, substituted with the opposite, is if we try to let go again and again. I, th I will talk about t tomorrow about the at least the third and fourth jhana and what to do after one has experienced them in order to practice this letting go of our identifications. I think at this point in time the explanation suffices for just knowing where we are stuck, what we're doing, what we're doing wrong. The whole world does it wrong. And even people who are so keen on doing it right, and there are many, many really well-meaning people, when they see the whole thing from the standpoint of me, it can't be right. It must be wrong. It can still be helpful. The Brahma Jala Sutta, which is number one in the Digha Nikaya, in the Long Discourses, gives 62 views, which are supposedly headings for all the views that mankind can, can have, can possibly have. And the Buddha says, in English, Brahmajala Sutta means the net of views. Um, the Buddha says, all of them are wrong. There isn't a right view to be found. And why? Because every view that we have comes from the misunderstanding of me. I have that view. Obviously, that's how we have to start. I have to investigate the khandas, the aggregates. But as we investigate them and see them, it may be possible without this mirror image to see that they're only arising and ceasing. And nobody makes them arise and cease. Nobody there. Now when you meditate, 
do you make all those distracting thoughts arise or do they just arise? They arise and then they cease again and then they arise again and then they cease again. And when you become aware of that, do you make awareness or can you be aware? Investigate it, find out, look at it. And then the question that arises Inquire into it, ask it, get an answer, ask again. We first have to have the intellectual understanding, particularly of the dukkha and the problems that our me illusion always generates. The me illusion can do nothing else because it needs a support system. The me illusion needs a support system, a very strong one, because it's an illusion. You don't have to walk around this house and say, here's a house, this is a house, this is a meditation hall, here's a meditation hall. It's obvious it's here. That's not an illusion, it's there. But me needs constant reinforcement because it's not there. And then we often don't get it, especially from those people where we want to get it from. And if we don't get it, then the me crumbles. We feel awful and we start all over again trying to find reinforcement. Reinforcement is so important because it's an illusory thing, nebulous, not based on any solidity and because of that we're looking constantly that we are told by someone that we are somebody. That's why meditation is difficult until we have left somebody behind. 